Hi, how are you? I hope you are having a wonderful time with lots of reading. I'm Esther Seb, I read and research comics, and in this series I start rereading Sandman, the legendary comic series written by Neil Gaiman and drawn and coloured and lettered by many artists. In this video I'm going to talk about the first two books of the collection, as you can see behind me, Preludes and Nocturnes and The Doll's House. I'm going to compare my experiences, what I see differently now, having read these stories for the second time, what are the things that I appreciate even more now than for the first time. Neil Gaiman frequently discusses how he and the editor of DC Vertigo, Karen Berger, started brainstorming over series that Neil Gaiman could write, how they were making efforts to insert a, a new story into the DC story art, but uh, they also wanted to bring something new and gradually Sandman and the character of Dream was born. You can also watch videos on YouTube with uh, Neil Gaiman discussing how uncertain the whole venture was in the beginning. Actually the third volume Dream Country is the result of this uncertainty. You can find short stories here uh, that are only loosely connected to the main body of the narrative. They are very interesting though and they will be the subject of my next video. I started reading the first volume of Sandman without expectations really. I had some ideas about how great it could be because it had so much influence over stories coming afterwards, but I really didn't expect that my mind would be blown away by the complexity of this story. And uh, if I really like a comic, usually what happens is that I start drawing the characters in it and in due course this is what happened to Dream and all the others in the story. I was impressed by the story, which I found truthful and deep, but I was equally impressed by the art. I just love this 80s, early 90s look that we can find in the series. I just love that each of the volumes emphasizes that the line is such a powerful agent in comics. People who know me know that I'm obsessed with drawing and especially with cross-hatching and I myself have written so much about this topic so it is little wonder that I love the art in Sandman. Small personal lines as well as big energetic ones play important roles in telling the story of a dream. I think this aesthetic is very different from how we draw and how we consume comics today, so it is particularly interesting to me. I also enjoyed that our character Dream is not our Hollywood handsome guy. He is very sinister, quite often difficult to understand, he is sucking and he can be violent as well. Those of you who have read Sandman know that at the beginning the character is captured by accident. Neil Gaiman also talks about the circumstances of how Dream enters the story and how Dream enters the DC universe. There had to be an explanation for why a character who is so important and who meets other DC characters has been away and has not appeared in the stories of any other DC heroes. There had to be a continuity within the DC universe. And Gaiman said that Dream has way away on some quest, this is why he is not present in any other stories, and this is also the reason why he is weak and why he is captured. He is waiting for decades in silence, and he's waiting for the captors to make a bad move so that he can set himself free. And there is a lot of tension going on, both underneath the surface of his face, which never stirs, and in the world, very strange things start to happen. There are nightmares, dream issues, some people cannot dream, some people dream for decades, some people never wake up. Lives are spent dreaming and all this happens because dream is captured. I think this is a very strong starting point for the story and then things will get more and more exciting. Dream escapes from his prison and then we find ourselves somehow in the world of folk tales. There are three obstacles that he has to overcome, three objects were stolen from him and he wants them back. My impression is that the creators, the editors and Neil Gaiman were getting more and more confident about the story and this is the reason why the third story is a lot longer and a lot more complex than the first two stories, though those are of course very exciting and they are very much Gaiman-like. 
In the third story, a person captures innocent people and tortures them in a restaurant. They cannot leave the building, time stops for them, and then they are forced into repeating timelessly some very cruel acts. They are forced to do savage things with themselves as well as with each other. The creative team was given a lot more space to experiment and to elaborate their ideas. And I remember that for the first time reading this section, which is actually a story within the story, I was really shocked by the cruelty of it. And again, just like I said in the beginning, it feels true. It is cruel and true at the same time. On second reading, I could pay more attention to details, visual details and narrative details. And I could pay attention to how this story links to the second volume, to the Doors house. Dream is reserved in this story. This was very strange for me when I was reading it for the first time. Now I know that being reserved is an important aspect of Dream's character. He is distant from humans and at the same time he is very compassionate. I think I can safely say, and it is not a spoiler, that Dream overcomes all the three obstacles. Well, this is the first volume and there are nine more. Preludes and Doctors does not finish with Sandman winning the third object back. It finishes with a meeting, Dream meets his sister, Death. We find out about the Endless, we get to know the family of the Endless a little more, and we also get some info on the relationship of Dream and Death. Death is a compassionate, gentle character. I just love the way that she is formed, the way that she approaches humans and takes them to the last journeys. And she is also very gentle with Dream, Dream is actually stalking. He has lost his aim because he has completed his aim. He has had his revenge and now he feels empty. I can totally relate to this. Somehow when one finishes one project or accomplishes an aim, things feel empty. And it takes some time to find a new goal, to find a new reason to carry on. And this stillness can be a burden. Yes, it feels good to restore the balance of things, but also being without a name can be difficult. I really appreciate that the first volume finishes with this lyrical story where we find out more about the character, where we can connect to him. And although he is endless and powerful and is very strange sometimes, he is relatable. He does become a hero that we want to know more about and actually in the second story we will. And now let's move on to The Doll's House, which is the second volume in my 10 volume collection of Sandman stories. A lot of things are going on in The Doll's House. We have a mythological beginning, we have our main plot obviously, which includes a small section of time travel, and then we have again a conclusion that elevates the story to a higher level. The story includes a lot of self-reflective elements and I really enjoy them on the second reading, so I made tons of notes. The Doors House starts with Tales in the Sand, a story that seemingly does not relate to what is being told. However, it gives a mythological perspective of the whole Doors House story. In Tales in the Sand, a young boy is told the story and the history of his tribe and via this act of telling, memorizing and getting ready for retelling it in the future, he becomes a man. This is an initiation story which calls attention to the limits of telling stories. Emphatically, this is a story that is told by men to boys and at the end of the story the narrator calls our attention to this fact, to the limitations in what has been shown to us as the creators of this version were all men. We do not know how the story is told by the women of the tribe. This story reminds us of limits and so does actually the title of the Doors House. Because if you imagine a Doors House, it is small, it is a confined space, it is a limited space, which will be a very important idea in the plot. Apart from Dream, the other main character of the Doors House is Rose Walker. She is related to two of the characters in the first volume. She is the granddaughter of Unity Kincaid and she knows someone who was manipulated in the third story of the first volume. Someone who was uh, captured by this madman and was tortured in the restaurant. Unity Kincaid's story is special because as a child she fell asleep and she never woke up. Sadly, 
she was raped and this way she had a daughter. Rose Walker is her granddaughter. Rose actually inherits an actual DOS house from Unity as well as the conflict itself. I love the second volume of Sandman because of its ideas. I made a list of my favorite ones. So the first one would be the idea of cataloging the dreams in Dreaming, the land of Morpheus. I find this fascinating that you can take a list and check out the items, check out the dreams that you have met. And I equally love the idea that dreams can escape from this land of dreams. They can go to the human world, they can have interactions with humans. This idea, however, is made even more complicated when it turns out that Rose is dreaming about somebody making a catalogue of dreams or to take things one step further she is not dreaming about it but has a direct access to what is happening in dreaming i have mentioned that dreams can escape from the land of dreams and the scariest dream the corinthian escapes especially to harm humans he attends a serial killer convention which is i think a very fascinating and also a very scary idea Another element in this story that I appreciated is Rose Walker's brother, who dreams about the Lord of Dreams. But this character that he is dreaming of is not our Morpheus, not the person that we know, but somebody who is a parody of Morpheus. The Lord of Dreams, as dreamt by the brother of Rose Walker, is a parody of all the seriousness, mythological depths, metaphysical questions that Morpheus represents to us readers. This character is also a tongue-in-cheek parody of the superhero tradition of DC Comics. He's always very happy to save the world, he's always looking for new and new actions to engage in. In a way, I think he's related to Miracle Man by Alan Moore. I don't know if you see this connection or not, maybe you want to leave a comment about it. The representation of these parodistical characters saving the world evokes Winslow Mackey's Little Nemo in Slumberland. Um, that these were one-page installments where Little Nemo was dreaming and in Slumberland, in the Land of Dreams, he had the most amazing adventures which were beautifully represented by Mackay. In the very last panel, however, he always woke up. This way he was forced to return to reality. The evocation of Winslow Mackay's beautiful world emphasizes the contrast with Sandman's darker tones. I do not want to reveal much about the story of the Doors House because it's a very engaging one. I just want to talk about the character of Morpheus in the story. He is equally interested and disinterested in humans. He is involved in the story of Rose Walker and her brother. However, when he should really help and he should really be there for the humans, he leaves because he has a prior arrangement. As it turns out, the prior arrangement is also related to humans. He has made friends with somebody called Hop centuries ago and each century, each 100 years, they meet and talk about what has happened to both of them. Dream seemingly abandons Rose in order to do his business. He doesn't tell Rose what he is doing. We readers know and we learn to appreciate what is going on. As a reader, reading the story of the prior arrangement is particularly interesting because we can follow the small details change. I particularly like the detail when Sandman tells Hob off for being involved in the slave trade. And the contrast between what is happening to Dream, he is an endless, his life is infinite, and what is happening to Hob, he just goes around the wheels of fortune, is striking. Dream is interested in Hob because of the difference of their fates. Why this section provides us readers details about Dream's interest and disinterest in humankind, it also shows that Neil Gaiman actually is fond of humans. And now I would like to go back to the mythological story with which we opened the collection and relate everything to the metaphor of the Doss House. Obviously it's an object, but it is also a metaphor that can be interpreted on several levels. For both the humans and the endless, the Doss House is a stage on which actions are played out. It goes back to mythological times, to the beginning, to the first story of the collection, where we read about a love affair Morpheus was involved in, and it also reaches back um, in human time via Hobbes' story. Geographically speaking, it is also almost infinite, and in spite of this, the Doss House is a limitation to both humans and the endless. The humans and the endless are related to each other and they are the limitations and they are also the freedom for each other that enable 
the other to act, but they also tie their hands. There is a certain responsibility on the part of the endless. They are responsible for the humans and they are endless compared to the humans. Both humans and the endless are dolls in the doll's house. Both can be manipulated. For example, humans can be manipulated by the escaped dreams who can invade their lives or murder them. The figure of the doll is obviously an object, but it is not without life. We can project a personality to dolls, if you think about actual dolls that you might have had in your childhood, or dolls in horror movies. So they, they have some sort of agency, but they have also their limitations. However, in this um, volume, I think the emphasis is not on the figure of the doll, but in the space in which the doll dwells, the doll's house. And the volume is a way to examine the relationship between finite and infinite beings. This was my rereading of the first two Sandman volumes. If you have read Sandman, if you have listened to the audiobook, if you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment below. If you would like to find out more about my work, check out my website or my Patreon page. I would like to thank my Patreon supporters for all the discussions we have and for their support. If you haven't read Sandman or if you feel like rereading it, this might be the time to start. See you in the next video. Bye.